Okay, you know what? Let's we'll uh, we'll start with a a clicker question here. Okay. All right. So our 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 question will start off, and we will say that. Um, let's say that um, uh, what are we saying? Okay, we'll say the weight of cats. So these will be uh, house cats follow a normal distribution. Would mean equal to 8.9 pounds and standard deviation equal to 1.2 pounds. I'm kind of making up this information. I think the average weight of cats is somewhere around there. All right, so the question is, what proportion of cats weigh, we'll say, more than um, ten and a half pounds? Okay, what proportion of cats weigh more than ten and a half pounds? I got to figure out the, <laughs> some answer choices myself here. Okay, so this Okay, so we will say your answer choices are So we'll, uh, we'll see, these are uh, answer choices. Whoops. Let me uh, get this session going and uh, we'll go ahead and work on this. I think I did this. I hope I did this correctly. Okay, I've opened up the, uh, the clicker poll so you can uh, get your answers in. If you, uh, if you need to talk to your neighbor, you're welcome to talk to your neighbor for clicker questions. Now let's see. Okay, I'm going to pause the video if you're watching online. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the, uh, the first clicker question here. Oops, that was a mistake. Okay, so um, the answer there, answer choice is... Uh, Correct answer is D. Okay, it looks like uh, you know when when we started off, some of you guys had clicked B, and it looks like uh, a lot of you had corrected that and chosen D after perhaps consulting with your neighbor. So uh, so that's great. Um, the idea here, and uh, and I think you guys got it. If we were to draw a picture, we would put 8.9 in the middle because that's the mean, and we are drawing a vertical line at 10.5. And the question is, what percentage weigh more? So what we have to do is we have to get a z-score. And we say 10.5 minus 8.9 divided by the standard deviation of 1.2. We get a z-score of 1.333. When we go to our uh, normal table, We look up 1.3. Yes. I think your mic is dead. My mic is dead? Oh, you're correct. All right. Let me uh, pause. All right. 
Okay, so what was I saying? I was saying uh, you get z equals 1.333. All right, we round off to 1.33. The number we find in our table is 0.9082, okay? That's the area to the left. The table always gives the area to the left. So if you selected B, that is not correct because it says way more than 10.5 pounds. So we want this side over here. So we do 1 minus 0 0.9082, and the answer we get there is D. So our answer for the, uh, for the first question is D. Okay, this... Um, so we've learned how to do this. Now sometimes we might ask a question where I give you the percentile. Okay? And the question works in much the same way, but just the uh, backwards direction. Okay? So we will have, you know, percentile questions. Okay? And so the question might say, you know, we can talk about cats again. We'll say cats, the weight of cats, weight of cats follow a normal distribution. with 8.9 pounds and standard deviation 1.2 pounds. And then, uh, and then we could say, you know, how heavy is a cat in the, we can say, uh, 80th percentile. Okay. And so the question here is asking, you know, if I if I were to draw a picture, we've got this. In the middle we put 8.9 pounds. And what I'm saying is that here is some weight. The weight is unknown. But what we do know is that if I shade everything to the left of some of this unspecified weight is that this area is going to be 0.8. The area to the left of, you know, of this weight is equal to 0.8. Okay, and so the, uh, the steps here is going to be start at the table and you find the z that corresponds that corresponds to the percentile. All right. And then once you find that, then convert the z back to a weight. So we're going to go to the z table, and we're going to try to find the z. Where is the z that gives me something close to uh, a weight of 0.8? Okay. Now we we have to go through all of these numbers, but they're all in order, so it's not so bad. And we find two values that are very close, but not exactly equal to 0.8. Okay. I have 0.7995. So we're checking the areas part. Okay. So I have 0.7995 and I have 0 0.8023. And between those two numbers, I would say 0 0.7995 is closer. Can you guys find that value on your table? Okay. And so what is the Z that gives me an area of 0.7995? Yeah, Z is equal to 0 0.84. And that's we'll just deal with that. Okay, we're not gonna we're not gonna try to interpolate uh, you know the third decimal point or anything like that. We'll say z equals 0 0.84, you know, gives area equal to 0.7995, okay? So that's the closest value. The closest value in the table closest value in the table to point, 0 0.8 
is 0 0.7995, okay? And so we will say, all right, z equals 0 0.84. And then now that we have z equals to 0 0.84, all we have to do is we convert that z back to a, um, a weight, all right? And so the way we're going to do that is we just say, Okay, let's recall the formula for z. z is equal to x minus mu divided by sigma. And we're going to plug in the values we know, and the value we don't know is x. So I have 0 0.84 is equal to x minus the mu, which is 8.9, divided by sigma, which is 1.2. We're going to solve for x, so I multiply both sides by 1.2, and I add 8.9 to both sides. So I have 8.9 plus 1.2 times 0 0.84. This is just algebra, right? Is equal to x. We, uh, we punch this into our calculator. We get 8.9 plus 1.2 times 0.84. And I get 9.908. 9.908. Right. So how heavy is a cat in the 80th percentile? You know, about 9.9, .9, maybe if you want to keep it another decimal, 9.91 9 pounds. Sure, that sounds good. Okay. Is that is that process okay with everybody? Yeah? Okay, so let's uh, we'll try another example here. I'll give you guys another clicker question. We'll, uh, we'll try this out. Okay, so I will say um, Okay, so we'll say, you know, SAT verbal SAT verbal scores uh, follow the normal distribution with a mean of 500. Oh, well, this makes it easy. Okay, mean of 500 and standard deviation of 100. Well, that standard deviation makes it really easy. But, okay, we'll say um, how high is the verbal score in the... Hmm, Figure this out here. Seventy fifth percentile. Okay, and your answer choices. Okay, so we will uh, we will say that these are your answer choices. We can go ahead and try this out. We're going to say verbal scores follow a normal distribution with mean 500, standard deviation 100. How high is the verbal score in the 75th percentile? Okay, go ahead and try that out. If you want to talk to your neighbor, you can. <laughs> And, uh, and again, I will pause the video here. Okay, let's take a look. And that is correct. 90, 91% uh, of you got that right. Okay, so again, the, uh, the way we do this, the way we solve, is we draw our normal curve. We put a 500 in the middle. We're going to put this cutoff here, and we want 75%. We want this area to be 75%. And so this requires what we're, what we're going to do is we go to the table and we're looking for the value closest to 0.75.
and the value I find that's closest to 0.75 is 0.7486. Okay, well there's two values that are very close, 0.7486 and 0.7517. And 0.7486 is what, 14 ten thousandths away, and 7517 is 17 ten thousandths away. So I'm going to go with 0.7486. Um, I mean, it probably doesn't make too much of a difference, but this corresponds to z equals to 0 0.67. Okay, so here I got z is equal to 0 0.67, and so solving for x, I got 0 0.67 is equal to x minus the mean of 500 divided by the standard deviation of 100. I solve for x and I get, you know, 500 plus 67, and I get 567 as my x. So that is my answer. Now, some of you guys selected answer choice C, and I think the mistake you made there was if you look up z equals to 0 0.75, if you look up the row 0 0.7 and the column 0.05, then the value you would pick there is, you know, 0.7734. This is not what you want to do, okay? We are not looking up z equal to 0.75. You are looking up the z that gives you 0.75. So we're looking up the 75th percentile we want. What is the z? We want the z that gives an area. Of 0.75, not um, <coughs> not z equal to 0 0.75. Okay, is that all right? So we've got the forward re reading and the kind of reverse reading of using the <coughs> normal normal table here. Okay, are there any questions regarding the normal distribution before I move on to our next topic? Are we feel good? Okay, the, um, then the next thing I want to talk about is the binomial distribution. So again, we are still kind of in this uh, umbrella topic of random variables. Random variables being the outcome to a random experiment, and that outcome is a number. So in the binomial distribution, this is another random variable. This is what we call a discrete random variable. And the term discrete random variable means that you know, it's the outcome to a random experiment. The outcome is a number, but only certain values are allowed. Okay, so it's a, it's a random variable, just like okay, you know, outcome to random experiment. Random uh, outcome is a number. Only certain values are allowed. Okay. So this could be something like I flip the coin 10 times, how many times does it land heads? Well the number of times it lands heads can only be 4 times or 5 times or 6 times. It has to be a whole number. It, the coin cannot land heads 5.3 times, or it cannot land heads 5.7 times. Um, it has to be a whole number, so only certain values are allowed. Contrast that to the normal distribution where I say I'm going to pick a cat at random and we're going to weigh how much the cat weighs, and that cat can weigh 9.7 pounds, it can weigh 9.756 pounds, you know, if I have a very accurate scale, it could say it's 9.754, I don't know, whatever however many decimals you want, any any value is allowed, right? And, you know, technically as that K 
cat sits on this super accurate scale and it's breathing out carbon dioxide, then the, the weight of the cat drops down every, you know, breath by breath, right? That's, that's how you uh, lose weight when you uh, exercise. It, it, it's expelled out through carbon dioxide. You're, when you, uh, well, anyway, OK. <laughs> um, you literally breathe, breathe off your fat as, uh, as your body burns calories. Um, OK, so only certain values are allowed. So you know, an example is, uh, you know, we flip a coin 10 times. And we count the number of times it lands heads. So, you know, we can only get a whole number of heads. forget. Is zero a natural number? I don't, I don't know. I'll just subset the number here. Okay, let me, let me specifically talk about what a binomial, we'll talk about the binomial random variable. So this applies to just very specific situations. This example that I gave you is a binomial situation, um, but the binomial situation is this. You repeat the same trial, or you repeat a random experiment n times. So in this example that I provided, we are flipping a coin 10 times. Okay, So that's, that's the thing that we are repeating. Flip a coin 10 times. We are repeating the random experiment n times. And in order for it to be binomial, each experiment can only have two outcomes. Okay? And so when we're talking about a coin flip, the coin can only land heads or not heads. Okay, and so, you know, in a coin, coin we naturally think has only two outcomes, but it could be something such as we're, we're talking about someone's eye color. But we just have to make it so there's only two possible outcomes. Maybe someone either has blue eyes or not blue eyes, OK? And if we say these are the only two possible outcomes, either someone has blue eyes or they don't have blue eyes, then it's binomial. But if you're trying to keep track of you know, how many have blue eyes and how many have brown eyes and how many have green eyes and blah, 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 then it's no longer a binomial thing. You either have to say it is or it isn't, OK, in order for it to be binomial. Each experiment can only have two outcomes. And we arbitrarily label one of these things success and failure. Okay. Now, we normally associate success with good things and failure with bad things. But these are just terms that originated you know, a while ago. And they're not necessarily good nor bad things. They're just either it is or it, it is not. But in the terminology, we use uh, success and failure. And with the binomial random variable, each trial has the same probability of a success. Okay, so, you know, every time I flip the coin, each coin flip has probability 0.5 of heads, or probability of heads equal to 0 0.5. If this were somehow to change, like the first coin flip 
it's 0.5, but then, I don't know, the next coin you pick up something different and it has a different probability, then it's no longer binomial. Binomial is you're repeating the same thing, and every time you repeat it, it has the same probability. And then lastly, uh, what makes it binomial is we are interested <coughs> in the uh, interested in a particular number of successes. We are interested in the probability of x successes and if I can fit this order does not matter. Let me go back and say each trial has same probability of success and that same probability of success is labeled P. Okay? And we are interested in the probability of X successes and the order does not matter. So I'm going to say I'm going to flip the coin 10 times and I want to know what's the probability it lands heads 4 times out of 10. I don't care if it's the first 4 flips that land heads and the last 6 land tails or not heads <laughs> or if it's the last 4 or if it's like you know, flips two, five, seven, and eight. It doesn't matter. It's just I need four heads out of ten flips. The order does not matter. Okay. If order matters, then then it's no longer binomial. So let's um, we'll try an example here. So we'll say you know, let's say we have a special coin. All right, a special coin. Okay, and we'll say with a special coin, the probability of landing heads, I don't know, we'll say 0 0.7, okay, this is the probability of getting heads, and we will say we flip the coin, let me just start off with a simple case, okay, we'll, we'll flip the coin four times, and I want to know what is the probability I get two heads. Okay, and when I just say what's the probability I get two heads, the implication there is the order does not matter. Okay, uh, it's, it is implied order does not matter because I didn't say that I you know what is the probability that the first two flips are heads or something like that. Okay. We flip the coin four times. What's the probability I get two heads? Okay. Well, let's uh, let's well let me first show you how this is binomial. We know this is binomial because I'm, you know, four coin flips. So my n, which is the number of trials that I'm repeating, is four. Each flip. has, you know, probability of heads equal to 0 0.7. So we will say P is equal to 0 0.7. And I am interested in getting two heads. X equals the two. That's what we want. N is 4, P is 0 0.7, X equals 2. This is what we have. Okay, let's list off, let's try to calculate this probability the quote old-fashioned way. Alright, so using what we know. You know, we'll find the probability uh, using the rules we know. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to list off all the ways we can get four flips and two heads. Okay, so we'll say, you know, list all arrangements of four flips, <coughs> two heads. Okay, so I'm going to have heads, heads, tails, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, tails. tails. Heads, tails, heads, heads, tails, 
tails, heads, tails, heads, and tails, tails, heads, heads. Okay. I'm pretty sure I've got them all. Okay. There are six arrangements where you can have uh, whatever you call this, heads and tails. Two heads out of four flips. Okay. Each of these are mutually exclusive. If, if I get the sequence heads, heads, tails, tails, I cannot at the same time have gotten any of these other sequences. So the total probability is going to be the probability of this thing plus this thing plus this thing. We're going to just add all of the probabilities together. All right, let's. What is the probability of this first arrangement? Okay. It's going to be 0.7. That's the probability uh, that the first one is heads times 0.7. The second one is heads times the probability that the third one is tails, which is going to be 0.3 times 0.3. Is that good with everybody? Okay. And so I'm going to just kind of combine these together. I got 0.7 squared and 0.3 squared. All right. What is the probability that this one is? Uh, that we get this sequence. Okay, well the first one has to be heads, that happens with probability 0.7. The second one has to be tails, and that happens with probability 0.3. The third one has to be heads, so that's going to be probability 0.7. And the last one has to be tails, and that's going to be probability 0.3. We do the, we combine them, we get 0.7 squared times 0.3 squared. Okay, because with multiplication the order doesn't matter. The same logic applies here. I get 0.7 times 0.3 times 0.3 times 0.7, and when I rearrange my terms, I'm going to get 0.7 squared times 0.3 squared. And all of these will be 0.7 squared times 0.3 squared. Is that okay? So all six arrangements have the probability 0.7 squared times 0.3 squared, so I can add them all together. And my total probability will equal 6 times 0.7 squared times 0.3 squared. All right, are we satisfied with this? OK, what if I asked? And we can compute this out, and we'll get some number. We could ask, you know, we'll do another one. We'll say probability of heads is still 0.7. And we'll flip it four times. And this time I, I ask, what is the probability of getting three heads? And if I list off all sequences, we will find that there are four sequences. Okay, there are, these are the four possible sequences of having four flips and three heads. Okay, so what is the probability of this first sequence? This is going to be 0.7, and I would raise this to what power? <coughs> to the third power, right? And then I would multiply that by what? 0.3, and I would raise 0.3 to the first power, right? Because effectively, I want the probability of what we'll call this probability of success raised to the number of successes. I'm going to run out of space. Let me just move this down. So I've got probability of success raised to the number of successes. And I would multiply this by probability of what? Of a, quote, failure raised to the number of failures, right? So I've got 0.7, which is the probability of heads, and I need three heads times 
0.3, which is the probability of not heads or tails, raised to the number of tails, which is just one. Okay? And then I have four possible arrangements. So I would then multiply this by number of uh, arrangements. So my total probability So this case, the probability of getting three heads is going to equal 4 times 0.7 raised to the third times 0.3 raised to the 1. Okay? All right, and so if I wanted to do this symbolically, we will say the probability of getting a particular x is going to equal, and I'm going to just for now, I'm going to just write number of arrangements times, I'll put times, and, uh, and I want probability of success. And what is the symbol that we use for probability of success? It's P, and I'm going to raise it to the X power because that's how many successes I want. And I would multiply this by what? what would the probability of a failure be? 1 minus p, and I would raise this to the n minus x, right? Because if we're having a total number of n trials, then I would need to have x successes and n minus x failures. Okay. All right, so how do we figure out the number of arrangements? So, so far I had like simple examples where it's like four flips, two heads, and it's rather easy to list off those possible arrangements. But what if I had something like, oh, we're going to flip it 10 times and I want five heads, okay? There's a lot of possible sequences. There's actually 252 of them. Now, and I don't expect you to try to list them all out. I mean, you could, but that, that would not be fun. So the number of arrangements This can be found using, uh, I don't know, we call this com combinatorics. We'll, we'll call this combinations, okay? And so if we have n trials and we need x successes, then the number of arrangements where the order does not matter, number of arrangements. is equal, and we'll write n x. This is read as n choose x. All right. n choose x is given by this formula, and I don't expect you guys to have to memorize this. There's probably a button on your calculator that does this for you, okay? So on your calculator, depending on what kind of calculator you have, if you've got um, a Casio, it's probably over the division key. You'll find um, you'll find NCR probably somewhere over the division key, okay? And you would just hit something like 10, and then you would choose the NCR button, and 5, and you would get 200. 52. So if you do 10 NCR5, you would get 252. Okay. If you have a TI, then you probably there might be a you might have a math button or you might have a PRB button. Okay, or you might have to do math and then go through the menu to find PRB. <laughs> and then somewhere in there you'll find the menu option NCR. This covers probably like 90% of your calculators, all right? And then what you'll do is you'll do 10 NCR5, and you'll get 252. If, uh, if you can't figure this out on your calculator, you know, come see me, and I'll try to tell you, you know, what are the buttons you need to push for, uh, for getting this, okay? 
But this is how we can find the, uh, the number of arrangements. So all I'm going to do is just take this, and we will just plug this in into our binomial equation. Okay. Is everyone good with finding NCR somewhere on their calculator? Maybe, maybe not. OK, well, you can always come ask me, and I, I'm happy to help. All right, and so therefore, just kind of putting it all together, binomial, OK, identify n, p, and x, and the probability of getting x successes will be n choose x times p to the x times 1 minus p to the n minus x. Okay, Number of arrangements times the probability of success raised to the number of successes times the probability of failure raised to the number of failures. I think with a little bit of practice, you'll get this down. All right, we'll, uh, we'll end here. Have a great weekend, you guys, and we'll see you on, uh, on Monday.